today you had to leave your home right now and all you could take with you was one bag, what would you put inside it? Think about it. Some questions that may come into your head. Is this permanent? How long will I be away for? Will I return home soon? What about, shall I pack necessities? Or should I pack things of sentimental value, like photographs, like the stuffed teddy my dad gave me, or something that means a lot to you? And I ask you this question for two reasons. A, it's to put, ask you to put yourself into someone else's shoes. And B, it's to get you thinking. How long is this going to be? Is it permanent? Is it temporary? And, to, and, and your decisions you make really depend on that. So I call this the temporary tent. I took this photo three years ago in 2013 when I was in Lebanon. I was visiting some Syrian refugees living there. And as you can see, it's not very well made or built, not sturdy, won't, uh, you know, if it won't protect people from the different kinds of weather. In summer, you'll be hot. In winter, you'll be cold. And you can see a family living inside this, in the shelter. So when, when these families moved here to Lebanon, they'd obviously left Syria in a very rushed state. They took just what they could take with them. A few things came here, set up home in this random, in the middle of nowhere place. It was fresh out of the conflict. Emotions were high, were raw. What am I doing here? How did this happen? My home has been bombed. I've lost family members. How do I survive? On top of that, you've got your kids with you. On top of that, you're, you need to survive. Food, water, shelter. These are important for your everyday survival. Education, not really. Nothing else matters. You just need to live day for day. This photo I took two weeks ago. I was in Lebanon. And I visited a similar area that I had um, in the previous three years ago. What can you see from this photograph? It's this family is building this home. It's more structured. They've got a cement floor. They've got a slightly stronger wood structure, tarp covering the house. Not the ideal home for you or I, but still better than the previous one. And this is a moment, I think, when I was standing here and I took this photo, this is a moment I think that they would have realized that I don't think I'm going home anytime soon. Perhaps I may never even see my house again. And this is when the human mind starts thinking about the long term. Well, now that I'm here, now that this is home, what do I do? They start thinking beyond day-to-day -day living. They start thinking about education for their children. They can't just be sitting here playing with, sto um, with stones and sticks. They start thinking about job security. How do I earn an income to provide for my family? Food, water, what happens if someone gets sick? And essentially it's stability. How do, how do I find stability in such an unsafe, such an unstable environment? How do I feel a bit of normalcy in my life? So this is a tented school. What a lot of the international organizations do is they set up these schools within the tented settlements for the children. Now this is to give the children a sense of normalcy, a sense of routine. But it's important to remember that these toddlers, for many of them, they've been out of school now for over one to three years. That's too much. And the average number of years a person remains a refugee is 17 years. So if you look at this kid here, he's probably four years old. If you look at 17 years later, that's not a part of his life. That's a very significant majority of his life that he may not go to school, won't go to university, won't graduate. This is crucial information for us. And it's important to realize that less than 1% of refugees get resettled globally. Now this is very alarming when, this, when we look at this figure. 60 million refugees. The world has not experienced a crisis, a refugee crisis this extreme since World War II. 
Today, we have over 60 million refugees and internally displaced people living here. They can't stay home because it's not safe, and they're not welcome anywhere else. But let's bring things a little closer to home, Malaysia. In Malaysia, we have over 150,000 refugees, according to UNHCR, the official statistic. However, we believe the number is probably over 200,000. We ask, why do they come here? They come here for peace, for peace, so that they can escape war, they can escape death and persecution. And they stay in Malaysia for anything between two to two, to two years, to decades, many decades, in fact. And the question we must ask ourselves is, if these refugees are going to stay here, how do we address the situation? What do we do as Malaysians? And I think the refugee situation has made us realize how borderless a world we live in. Security, from a security perspective, terrorism, from disease perspective, the diseases are popping up all over the place. People are moving everywhere, cultural differences, and even education. I've seen the transformation of educational institutions changing their approaches so they can allow refugees access to education. And so today I'd like to quickly talk about this, talk about the transformations taking place in education globally and right here in Malaysia. And this has enabled refugees, regardless of their lo location, regardless of their status, this has enabled them to continue some normalcy in their lives, allow them some continuity in their education. And this has affected millions and millions of refugees globally. So we're talking, so right here we're talking about education. Now these, it's understanding the importance of this education and it's understanding that these are children that believe that education is their hope. Without hope, what life is there to, to live? And they believe that this is the platform that they can use to build a better future for themselves. So it is important for children because they need to thrive, not just survive, so they can reach their highest potential. It is also important for them because, you know, they need to go to school, they need to, they need to have a good life. And they are the future for their, for, their, for their people. If they don't go to school, we're looking at a lost generation. We're looking at over two million Syrian children that will not be able to return to their country, that will not be able to, will not be able to contribute to rebuilding their nation. And this is a horrible, horrible statistic. It's a very, it's a very scary, scary statistic. So now we've reached the point of rethinking access to education. This is what we're doing at the this is what we're doing at the refugee school that I run in Malaysia. Rethinking access to education. How do we give this tool to refugees so that they can empower themselves and make differences in their lives? What we know now is we cannot keep providing a temporary education. We need to have permanent education for all. When Fuji School first started, we were ad hoc. We did not know what we were doing, random syllabus, random exams. We were using a band-aid strategy. We have a cut, we place a band-aid on it. But we weren't dealing with the crux of the problem. We, know we, we knew we couldn't continue these efforts. We couldn't continue making mistakes like this. And we realized that we had to partner together with the right education institutions who were willing, who, were des who had the desire to say, look, we want to ensure that these children and these refugee youth have access to education, have access to learning, and we're going to, we're going to shake things up. We're going to shake it up and we're going to do what we have to do so that these refugee kids can go to school. So we've embarked on a new education path, not restricted and not limited by traditional constraints and by policy. So the first point, certified learning. What does that look like? All of you guys sit here, you want to get certific certification, right? You finish your degree, you get a nice certificate, you go on into the world and you get a good job. So we, this is what we want. What about refugees? What do they want? It is important for them as well to have certification. Very often they study here for many years in Malaysia and when they get resettled, they leave with nothing to show for it. How are they gonna get a job in another country? And so what we're doing is, we're working with partners to be able to overcome this hurdle. Let me, a quick story of that from Fuji School, where two of our students, Nawa and Ahmed, 
great students, high performing, high potential, and they got accepted to, into their foundation course at Nottingham University. So that's an amazing accomplishment for anyone. Exactly. But let me ask, how was this able to happen? How were they able to get, to get such a privileged opportunity? It started, yes, they're great students, but it started with Nottingham University, an, ed, an institution that said, we want these students to have a chance. Just because they're refugees doesn't mean that they get to lose out on an education. So what do they have to do? They did not say here, they did not sit there and go, show me your high school diploma. They said, look, we understand, you guys are refugees. You've missed out on huge gaps in learning. Some of these refugees missed out for years of school. They said, we don't want such, we want to interview you, we want to listen to you speak, we want to see everything you've done, and we will determine if we think you're a good fit for us. That's what they did. They broke down the, their criteria, they changed their admissions criteria, they were flexible, they were adaptable, they appreciated the situation, and because of that, two students now have a fair chance at life. Now they have certificates that will now allow them to build themselves a better future. What about borderless learning? Borderless learning at the Fuji School, we're talking about globalization, the breakdown of borders. And because of, because of this, we've started an initiative together with Singapore, Turkey, and Europe, and we're working together to have, it's called our Open University for Refugees. And this is an independent unit that we've started, designed to meet the educational needs of people, refugees, in these protracted conflicts all around the world. So what we do is we utilize technology, we utilize, utilize the internet, and we utilize uh, bringing, basically we bring education closer to the people and fostering an open culture, fostering inclusion. We're saying, let's come together to solve this problem. And we're using expertise from the universities, skill, knowledge, resources, things that we need to bring people together. But importantly, we're restoring dignity to individuals. And for about, what about educated refugees? People who come to Malaysia, they've got degrees, they, they can work, they can, they can contribute to the economy. Maybe we need to start thinking about policy. Maybe we need to say, hey, can we kind of rethink policy to make it work for refugees? Now, the, this is it. If our goal is that all children get educated, that all children go to school, and that nobody should be left behind, then we can achieve it because we know we have the technology, we have the internet, we have the resources, we have the expertise, we have the knowledge. All we need is the willingness. The, all we need is the willingness to say, yes, this is what we want to do and to make it happen. These are some quotes that I did not steal from a book or a video. These are some quotes that I actually took from people that I interviewed on my various on my various trips to Lebanon. It's important to understand, guys, that nobody chooses to be a refugee. Nobody wants to be a refugee. No one wants to leave their home. Nobody wants to leave everything they have like that and run away and live in a foreign land that they're not welcomed. All people want is peace and security. And with that, they will thrive anywhere. So the world has to come together to understand this and to understand what we can do to change that. And to finish up with this photograph, I took up this little boy, Nasser. His mom was killed, and now he's left here in a school in, in, in Lebanon, having to survive amidst all the trauma. We have the statistics, two million Syrian refugees, li, uh, children affected, 60 million refugees globally, but numbers are great, but they're just numbers. This is a face, this is a child. This is a kid affected directly by decisions of others. And so coming together to give him an education that then will open his doors, allow him to build a future and a platform for him so he can build the future, rebuild the future of his nation. Thank you.